Elizabeth Blunt, Irene News. Um, Mr. Jensen said that one of the solutions they've looked at was keeping the donors off the group that sets the priorities. I was going to ask um, okay. Helen how the donors felt about that. Thank you. And this lady here, uh, Natalie. Hi there, uh, my name is Shema Saif. I'm the coordinator at Yemen Relief and Development Forum, which is a, a diaspora-led uh, organization of Yemeni organizations in the UK. Um, my question is possibly to DFID and UN OCHA um, and maybe MSF as well. Um, you know, uh, Helen, you were talking, you know, very um, accurately about the issues that you're facing in terms of access um, and, and, and distrust within the local um, communities in Yemen. Um, and I, I understand that many of the other speakers as well were talking about the issue of access. Um, I mean, I come from a diaspora organization as a Yemeni, I'm a British Yemeni myself. And I mean, something that, this is something which is constantly uh, coming up and I'm just wondering what you guys think the role of the diaspora can play. Um, they understand both worlds, they speak, m many of them speak both languages. Uh, they will be able to get to places where the majority of the international NGOs will not be able to have access to. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of this transition in Yemen and reflecting, um, you know, trying to get into certain areas where there is dire humanitarian need, um, what role can the diaspora play? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Louis Liu, Chatham House. Um, related to the first question, um, there's a number of you on the panel talked about meeting the needs, and there was also talk about different agendas, particularly of elite groups. <coughs> Could you explain how the needs for the development agencies in particular uh, were developed, and what part the uh, Yemenis themselves played in that process, and how the final decision was made in terms of uh, whose priority was taken. Thank you. And Martin, over here in the... Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Martin Barber. I'm a retired uh, UN official. Um, there's one word that hasn't, so far as I could hear, been mentioned by anybody, and that's the uh, plant which is consumed after one o'clock <laughs> by very large numbers of Yemenis mm. and which consumes uh, a lot of the disposable income of people whose humanitarian needs you are trying to meet. Um, and I wonder, I, I'm referring to CAT for those who are not familiar with it, um, and, and I'm wondering how you, you, you play the, this problem of CAT into the design of your uh, humanitarian programs and the assessment of need uh, and and whether there isn't the possibility of uh, having to confront the fact that you may be um, assisting families to survive uh, by in and and thereby enabling them to spend their limited disposable income on cat rather than feeding their children thank you Martin Let's go back to our panel now. Um, I'm going to start with Helen. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, so to start with the Elizabeth's question about the UNHCT, so Trond and I have had many conversations um, about whether or not it's appropriate for DFID to join the HCT according to what's been discussed and, and, and whatnot. Um, DFID's broad position is that you do, what, you do what works in the context and what is good for the context. And so in some uh, countries, we are participating in the UNHCT and, and that can work and, you know, in some contexts we're not. And in Yemen, I think uh, the donors and, and OCHA and the, the, the rest of the UNHCT have been quite creative in realising that the donors are very interested in understanding these strategic discussions and influencing w them where that's appropriate. And if we're not able to access the UNHCT, then the... the there's a there's a disconnect that that could potentially undermine some of uh, some stuff as well. So it, go, it goes both ways, um, and we've we've come up with these quarterly meeting points where we do get together and discuss certain certain areas, and and that works for us in Yemen. But that's um, context specific, um, and so as we've been working through that. But then I, you know I also do want to say 
I do wonder how many of the Yemenis in Abiyan would n even know what a UNHCT is and care whether or not Diffid's sitting on it. <laughs> that's, that, that's another discussion. Um, Shaima, in relation to the, the, the diaspora <coughs> groups, I mean, I, I know I don't know what's going on in Yemen. I know that I don't know. And the diaspora groups that I've met with have, have often been huge sources of inspiration and local knowledge. And I've met many in Sana'a who are, who are doing great work with the Humanitarian Forum. And my mind immediately went to um, the country director for IRC currently, um, who's a diaspora member from the UK who's gone back to lead up an international NGO and you know and he speaks the language and he ha does have connections and that's a really important important role I think the diaspora have been particularly important in keeping the issue on the agenda in the public sphere back here in the UK around the sorts of you know like the Friends of Yemen civil society organizations were critical in that <coughs> pre-event and getting the media coverage and and whatnot um, and that does keep it up the political agenda, which facilitates the humanitarian funding, and which facilitates actors on the ground being able to uh, being able to receive that. Um, I'm not sure that I, I I followed the question from Chatham House on the development priorities. Was it about the involvement of Yemenis generally in the, the, the human coming up with the humanitarian plan? Um, because I, I think I may defer somewhat to Trond um, in terms of the process for the humanitarian program cycle and and lastly you're right we didn't talk about cat very obvious omission um, and the political economy of cat in in Yemen is obviously of great concern to Diffid more broadly on the from the humanitarian perspective there's there's a couple of things to say in some of the evaluations that we've done of our um, emergency programs which have been given giving cash to very very vulnerable households, it's been interesting to see um, feedback from communities about what they have spent that money on. And of course, the UK was very nervous that we were going to get a report that they were spending it all on CAT. Um, but the reality was that they, that they weren't. Um, and one of, the, one of the findings that I find most interesting was that if the money was given to the female head of the household then it, the money didn't walk to the market and it didn't get spent on, on cat. There was, a, there was a, a cash flies quote that came back to us from one of these evaluations. But the, the bigger question about the political economy piece, I think, is one that DFID more broadly is working through its position on. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll pass over to Trond. Thank you. Thank you. We'll Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that we have a very good relationship with donors. Uh, particularly DFID, and that they really have uh, set an example to be followed, whether it's in terms of multi-year funding and, and what have you not. Uh, and in addition to in addition to uh, to what she has already mentioned, uh, what Helen has already mentioned about having a good relationship through quarterly meetings, making sure that our assumptions uh, in terms of planning uh, are being shared with with donors, as well as an overview of what is happening. Um, informally, there is also a monthly um, lunch between the humanitarian coordinator and the donor community so that they can get an update on the situation uh, as well as the overall priorities. Um, when it comes to the diaspora, I, I think the diaspora, as Helen said, plays an enormous role in terms of making sure that the situation is Yemen, in Yemen is known to, to a larger audience. Um, and as I also mentioned, uh, we put great emphasis on, on using local organizations in terms of advocacy, in terms of actually providing services across Yemen. It's one of the few ways that we're actually able to reach people in remote areas and difficult to reach areas where, where there is high insecurity. Um, so, it's, um, so that applies both in terms of uh, um, organizations based in Yemen as well as diaspora organizations. Um, and as part of that, we, we have a, a capacity building a program um, and it's part of the overall um, strategy through the Yemen Humanitarian Response Plan. When it comes to the involvement of, of, uh, of Yemenis in terms of defining the uh, overall uh, Humanitarian Response Plan in Yemen, what we did this year 
uh, in terms of trying to increase the participation of local organizations was that we decentralized the entire process. So we started out in the regions uh, to make sure that we had on board local government, that we had on board <coughs> local organizations uh, before we did the overall strategy and planning exercise. Um, we even had groups like the Al Houthis involved in terms of uh, setting priorities in, in areas. Um, now, I think it's um, um, I think it's important that uh, not only looking at the participation uh, in terms of the planning process, but also looking at the the other end of it. And one of the things that we are trying to do through the humanitarian response in Yemen is to increase the accountability to beneficiaries. So that's also built into the overall strategy that there is a feedback mechanism uh, that we tap into. Um, the the last question referring to, to GATT, it is unfortunately very often the elephant in the room in the discussions that we have with governments and that we have with local organizations. We know that 70% of, of water resources in the, that is available for agriculture in a country which is already the seventh most water stressed country on the planet are used for cat production. Uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, uh, as Helen alluded to, when it comes to um, um, disposable income being used for cat consumption, uh, among some of the poorest families, we know that perhaps up to a third is used for, for cat. So obviously it will have a huge impact on, for instance, nutrition, si the nutrition situation for children. Um, we also, I, I think there are a number of other elephants in the room. Demographic growth. Uh, the country is growing at more than 3% per annum. And if 90% of, of uh, staple foods are already imported, you can imagine what the situation is in 25 years when the, t when the population has doubled. So I think there are um, a, a number of issues uh, in this context, perhaps also to mention also the situation of women. Out of the 14.7 million women, uh, we know that women are amongst the vulnerable. The World Economic Forum every year undertakes a um, gender gap uh, index uh, exercise which looks at women's access to income, women's access to health care, political processes, uh, protection under the rule of law. For the last five years, uh, Yemen has come last. That's one of the things that we have fully incorporated in the Yemen Humanitarian Response Plan, full well knowing that uh, to be able to address the most vulnerable, we need to address the situation of women. Uh, CAT, unfortunately, hasn't been um, considered as the part of the plan, but obviously it's something that we have to look at in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Tron. Um, I see we've got a number of questions that have come in online, which I'm going to prioritize next. But um, Mikhail and Steve, did you want to have a, a quick word on any of those questions? You don't have to address yeah. them all though very very brief comments maybe just on the on, on the uh on, on the diaspora and, and maybe just a reiteration of what i said earlier there are so many stakeholders that we have to deal with uh, so many layers of, of of political players that we need to engage in to secure this project uh, i'm thinking of aden in particular that uh let's say that globally we're looking uh forward to getting any help from anyone that's there to facilitate these discussions and contacts. And that would be just my, my answer. On, on, on CAT, uh, I was thinking that uh, uh, national lottery in the UK or in France hasn't been outlawed yet, uh, even though some of the finances of the families are also going in that direction. And that should be maybe argued. But but I agree that it's probably it's probably a, a huge you know a burden on, on on the human economy. What I'd like to to say on that is not really on cat. It's just to, to share uh, a, a testimony. Um, there's been I think a surge, not only on cat but on the use of of uh, synthesis drugs in Yemen, uh, and many patients that we see and many families and. Um, and relatives of patients are very high when they get to our facilities. And one of the reasons why they are very nervous is because they are high. And I think that uh, drug using usage is starting to be a serious public health problem in Yemen that should probably be addressed. 
in some way, uh, in addition to dealing with the social given that is cats, uh, to me. Thanks very much. Steve, did you ha want to add anything? Um, just very briefly, I, I suppose. That I, I think that you know, we could discussion, we could discuss COT um, all day. I think if we were to have uh, have a debate on on that, but um, the thing that speaks to a much broader issue, though, is uh, when you're, you know, when half of a country is is in need of urgent humanitarian assistance, uh, what happens to the longer term priorities, the the things that are always on the always on the agenda, but never anywhere near the near the top. Uh, be it the fact that the country is you know, dwindling water resources, uh, as we've heard, despite the fact that we have problems with, uh, with COT, which I don't think many people see a, a realistic uh, solution to. Um, and I think coupled with transition, that means that um, at the same time, at the exact point that people really want to see tangible progress on longer-term development objectives, there's, there's much less of, of an ability really to engage with those sorts of issues. Uh, so I guess that's just kind of a, a depressing comment that's not leading anywhere, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve, I think. Well, I'm, we're, we're running out of time, but we've got four questions from our online audience, and so that's sort of nicely balanced with the four we've just had. So I'm going to read those out, and I'll ask our panelists to be brief and perhaps not to address all of the questions, but to choose the ones that, uh, that they feel they want to talk to. So the first one is from uh, Munir Al-Subari, who is with UNHCR in the Yemen. And uh, Munir says, I, I believe that the humanitarian effort shall not terminate in any situation. Um, as the humanitarian community, we're obliged to advocate for sa safe access to reach the people of concern. As the situation has escalated in Amran, how, what would be our response you know, in that current situation? So I don't know if that's clear to the panelists, I guess given that, given that we're obliged as humanitarians to respond, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that situation? The second question is from Mohammed uh, Qaid, I think, I hope I haven't massacred your name, from Optimize CS in the Yemen. Um, some areas are still treated as conflict areas, yet, it, yet they could be regarded as post-conflict with, with a different intervention strategy. My question is, what criteria are used to define conflict areas? Well, that's quite a good question. And then uh, from Arwa, who is a Yemeni student in the UK, I would like to know more about third-party monitoring in Yemen that's carried out by DFID, its objectives, and how it is feeding to better respond to the needs on the ground. So how it's, yes, how it's informing uh, response on the ground. Then the fourth question is from Myron Jesperson, who is a, with Partner Aid World Relief Partnership, who is a World Relief Partnership facilitator. Sorry, Myron, if I've got that wrong. Um, also on third-party monitoring, how do you ensure that the monitor understands the context or the community and the program? And is that information shared beyond DFID or the implementing partners? So I see we've got a, a couple of questions directed specifically uh, at Helen. And then finally, from Twitter, um, Hajir Malim, Country Director at Action Against Hunger, Yemen. With the competing priorities within development and emergence and the development and emergency ambit, how linked are all ongoing initiatives in political humanitarian fields? And this is directed to Helen or Trond. Um, so that's five questions, actually. Um, do, you, do any need repeating, or can I? Maybe I'll start with... Um, Put Salim on the spot and see if you want to respond to any. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to respond to, to some of these questions, really. Um, I'd, be, I'd be more curious to hear, to hear others speak okay, about them. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, Trond, we'll work our way down the table. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure I quite understood the first question, but I think in terms of our responsibility as humanitarians, uh, I think when it comes to the conflict in Amran, it is to talk to the parties to make sure that they understand their responsibility to protect civilians in, in, in the conflict. Uh, of course, the other thing that we will be going do that we are already doing on an ongoing basis is to access um, to negotiate for access to effect affected populations, uh, and then thirdly to provide uh, assistance where we can. Um, with regards to the second. Uh, question: What? What? Um, it's a very difficult question. What? Um, 
how do we define a post-conflict uh, and a conflict area? I think the ICRC has uh, a clear definition of, of what constitutes conflict, which is perhaps not all of us uh, utilize in this uh, situation, but where there is uh, a certain level of violence and civilian populations are affected, uh, we normally consider that as a, as a conflict area, uh, leading to displacement, leading to other types of deprivation. Um, I'll leave the uh, third party monitoring questions to, uh, to, uh, to Helen. Um, I think third party monitoring are being utilized in a number of contexts, such as Somalia, uh, where it's difficult to, to reach areas um, for aid agencies uh, or for donors. Uh, so it is a means to actually verify that what you have set out to do can be done. Um, when it comes to the understanding of third parties in terms of what is what one is trying to achieve, of course that could potentially be uh, be a question unless they are somehow involved in the process of defining these activities. Um, when it comes to the last question, um, I, I think I al already alluded to it in, in the sense that as, uh, as humanitarians, uh, we are keeping a distance to the political sphere. Um, but as I hope I already uh, made clear, in order to address the long-term consequences uh, of humanitarian suffering in Yemen, uh, we need to be working with the developing, uh, development actors as, in a sense, we are only treating the symptoms and, and the real disease is under development, uh, poverty. Um, and in that respect, what we are wanting to see and what we are hoping to see and what we have been lobbying through the Friends of Yemen and other, other fora is that development actors need to start investing um, with the government, of course, uh, to provide basic services and also addressing issues of poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mikhail? Yeah, I, I'll be brief because as, as uh, Salim, I don't feel uh, an expert in, in, in most of those questions, but, I, but I'll answer to the, to the qualification uh, sort of question uh, regarding conflict and non-conflict. Just to say that, let's say basically that we don't need from an organizational point of view, we don't need to define whether we work in a conflict or in a post-conflict or not conflict. We do because it, it's, it's, you know, it, we do typology exercises, so we know whether you know, we spend that money in conflict or that money in non-conflict. But basically what we first need to define is our response to a context, and a context that evolves very quickly. And we've been staying in uh, Khamir, in Amran Governorate, uh, for the past four years in a very changing environment, adapting our responses to uh, that environment that was changing, closing part of the project or activities, shifting from uh, helping primary health centers in the valleys to uh, focusing on on hospital care at the moment were uh, wounded when we're arriving in numbers. So I guess uh, the uh, hard definition uh, is not interesting us, uh, of interest to us uh, very much. It's more, more, much more the, the analysis of the, of the situation itself. But having said that, I'm not rejecting totally the notion of qualifying a situation just because law exists IHL exists, and it also helps us uh, defining uh, some of our arguments with the different political stakeholders, their responsibilities, our duties as well, uh, and that helps. Uh, something that we've been doing quite massively, for instance, not so much in Yemen recently, but on CAR, where the qualification of the events leading to the uh, exodus of the, of, of the Muslims were, were of particular interest and importance for us. But in Yemen, uh, I would say that we do consider Yemen as a country in conflict overall, knowing perfectly well that there are some areas where uh, the intensity of the conflict is, uh, is low, and, but presumably can get higher very quickly. Thank you very much. Helen. Okay, I'll maybe start with Hadjar's question from ACF. And Again, Hadjar and I have also spoken at length about this topic. I think it's a very important um, question. And one that uh, comes up in 
many crisis situations where you have siloed humanitarian actors over here and you have development actors over there and they're all sort of making plans and somehow forgetting to speak to one another. Um, and I think in Yemen, we as donors and, and the, the, the UN agencies and others have all been, again, guilty of doing that to some, to some extent. However, um, I think there are some, there are some, there have been some inroads in, in sort of having this longer term humanitarian programming cycle that, that, that Trond is thinking about um, and, and trying to figure out where that programming cycle meets the, the UNDAF, which is the UN development framework. Um, and w we are hoping to, to, to come up with clearer thresholds. I mean, there's some, there's some good examples of work on this from Afghanistan and Haiti where clusters um, have been very clear on their thresholds of humanitarian targeting, which then enables development actors who are operating in the same geographical areas to know who it is they're targeting and, and who it is that the humanitarians are targeting. And, and, and sometimes that, that's not clear in, in complex environments like this, where you have development interventions and humanitarian interventions often in the same space. Um, one initiative that I'm, I'm, I'm pleased is going ahead is that the EU has chosen Yemen to be a, a pilot for its, its joint programming and resilience building uh, work over the coming years. And part of that is that the member states are getting together and having sort of heads knocked together to try to figure out some of these, these areas for complementarity. And in fact, I, I, I'll be going to, to Brussels next week to, as part of that process. There is, of course, still a gap with um, the Gulf donors who are, in the Yemen context, the traditional donors who have been around forever and ever and ever. And um, they are not participating in this particular initiative. So there remains a gap in terms of bringing, bringing all of the relevant uh, donors to the table in the longer term. And then in, in relation to, to our worst point about the, the third party monitoring, firstly, on the objectives, as I've said, we're incredibly constrained and we are looking for means to verify that the UK aid money is actually being spent, that there is actually a, a sort of wash facility in village X because our partner is telling us that it's there. So there is a basic means of, sort of verification that, that we're hoping will, will help uh, give us some assurances. But then there's a, a very important um, objective around creating a, a, a mechanism for beneficiaries, Yemenis, to actually tell us what they think. Maybe they don't want a toilet, um, or maybe it would be more important for them that the, 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 the tap stand is rehabilitated. But we, you know, the, we're hoping that that sort of uh, beneficiary feedback loop will come into creation. Whether or not we're going to be able to absorb that um, information easily and then filter it into our future planning it's not going to be seamless but it's certainly a, a real opportunity for us uh, to do that and in terms of who will have access to the information um we have contracted um a, a, an implementing partner in yemen and one of the re requirements was that the data would be open source and whilst there are some protection considerations around what data will be put online we are very hopeful that that will be able to be uh, accessed by people in, in, in future. Um, but one thing I should say is that, that that contract has only just started and our partners are busy figuring out what it is that they need to know from our partners and what they're judging people against. And um, so that's all sort of kicking off in later on this year. Helen, thank you very much. Steve, I'm going to give you the last word, um, last very brief word, because we're going sure. to have to, to close, please. Yeah, well, I'll keep it to 20 seconds or, or so. Um, other than just to say, uh, to reiterate some of the things that Helen was saying about, um, you know, I think that integrating the humanitarian and development agendas will be um, important in the future, or at least ensuring a smoother handoff than we've seen thus far will be particularly important. And I think this speaks to the question of, you know, how do we adjust our program between areas which are in conflict zones and which might be relatively more stable? Uh, which might actually be, be relatively stable in parts of the country where conflicts are um, concentrated in particular areas and there might be neighboring areas with, with far less levels of violence. Uh, but I think that on the, the broader question that Tron brought up of the longer term sustainable development, I think there 
really is no alternative than really looking to the Gulf states more and more and finding out how to engage them much more in this process. I mean, we look at the generosity of the Gulf states in terms of uh, pledges to, to Yemen and, and the Saudi government's depositing of, of a billion dollars into the, into the central bank and really helping to stabilize the macroeconomic position of, of Yemen. I think that moving on towards longer term development and, and dealing with very technical issues that they know very well related to issues such as uh, agriculture in, in you know, extremely trying circumstances and uh, desalinization and uh, actually and exploitation, frankly, of the country's natural gas resources as well. Um, really are the sorts of things alongside the urgent humanitarian needs that we need to keep, uh, keep an eye on moving forward to, to ensure that development isn't always tomorrow's priority. Thank you very much, Steve. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for a very interesting discussion today and to thank all of you for coming and for your questions. I'm sorry we don't have more time for more discussion, but uh, feel free and you're invited to stay behind uh, at the end of the event. We have refreshments in the, in the lounge over to the, the left here. Uh, and so please do join us and continue the discussion with our panelists. Thank you very much.